What's up everybody? I'm Dr. Garrett Rossi and I'm a board certified psychiatrist who makes mental health content here on YouTube. If you're new to the channel, I would love to make you a member of the community. Please consider subscribing and if you are already subscribed, thank you so much for the support. Today's video is going to be an interesting one because what we know is that it can be really difficult for both the patient and the clinician when we're dealing with treatment resistant depression. These are the most difficult to treat cases in all of psychiatry with regards to depression. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had a non-invasive method of treating these very difficult cases that had better efficacy than ECT and led to remission rates as high as 80%, 80%. That's significant and it always gives me pause when I see a number like that. So what if I told you there's a new type of TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, that leads to remission in 80% of patients with treatment-resistant depression? Would you be interested? I think this is a good opportunity to discuss the SAINT protocol of transcranial magnetic stimulation and explain to you why it's getting the results that it's getting in treatment-resistant depression. So SAINT stands for Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy. Now when you try saying that three times fast, it's kind of difficult, so we're just going to refer to it as SAINT here. This is not a new concept. SAINT uses non-invasive neuromodulation therapy, also known as TMS, in patients with treatment-resistant depression, and it showed some real promise in this area. Now, treatment-resistant depression, if you recall, can affect up to 30% of patients with major depressive disorder. So you might expect that it's hard to treat these cases, and looking for new and innovative methods of doing so is a high priority in the field of psychiatry. Now, when a patient reaches this point, we're normally trying to refer them for either off-label medication prescribing, ECT, or ketamine, but now, the FDA just approved a new version of TMS that is reported to have 80% remission rates in these patients. So this is very exciting and this is very high rates. Now the approval for this from the FDA actually came really, really quickly because the device received what's called breakthrough status by the FDA based on the impressive results from a study that included 22 participants, all of which had treatment resistant depression. Now, 19 of these 22 participants achieved remission, which in terms of a percentage is 86.4% of participants. So almost 90% of the people who received this treatment not only had a response to it, but actually had remission or total relief of all of their symptoms. Now, this is substantially better than other treatments for treatment-resistant depression, including ECT, which has a remission rate around 50% to 70%, depending on which article you read. All right, guys, so let's answer the question, what is SAINT? Now, I said SAINT stood for Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy, and of course, in case you were wondering, it was developed at Stanford University. So, kind of simple, it has it in the name, so we know where it came from. Now, what sets TMS procedures apart from other methods of TMS is the intensity of these sessions. So this requires the participant to have 10 sessions of TMS per day. So it's a 10 hour course of treatment per day and it's carried out over the course of five days. So we have five days of intense treatment, 10 sessions per day, per day each taking about 10 minutes in length to complete. The intelligent portion of the name, you might be wondering why they're calling it intelligent. So this is derived from the way in which they place the coil on the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So with TMS, what ends up happening is you have this magnetic coil that's placed on the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Now in regular TMS, this is sometimes inaccurate. Actually, in up to 30% of the cases, it's not accurate. So the coil doesn't get placed where it's supposed to get placed with the less precise methods or intelligent methods of placing it. But what they do in the SAINT protocol is they use MRI slash fMRI, so that would be a functional magnetic resonance imaging or magnetic resonance imaging, depending on which one we're talking about. And they use guided theta burst stimulation. So theta burst is a certain type of TMS. It requires a certain type of coil to produce. And this ensures proper placement of the coil on the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. 
Now, the device has made its way out of academia. So it started in the academic arena at Stanford University, and it's now being distributed by a private startup company called Magnus Medical. You can get on the waiting list to purchase one of these new machines. Right now, they should be coming out in 2023. And if you can feel, feel compelled to do so after this talk, it won't be because of me because I have no affiliations with the company and you might want to pump the brakes before opening your wallet for this one and I'm going to explain why in the next sections. Okay guys, so let's talk about what research actually led to FDA breakthrough status and approval for Saint. Now in general, in the United States, the devices, medical devices, are not held to the same standards as medications are when gaining FDA approval, and this is no different for this device. So it's actually much easier to get approval for a device than it is for a medication. Now, the initial work that we talked about at the beginning of this video with the 22 participants was actually carried out in what's called an open label format. So this is basically people knew that they were getting the treatment. So it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, and this is generally considered a lower form of evidence. Now, this same research group from Stanford eventually did publish a randomized controlled trial in the American Journal of Psychiatry, which is a fairly prestigious journal in the world of psychiatry, and this is largely what led to the FDA approval. Now, in this study, instead of 22 participants, they enrolled 32 participants, all of which had treatment-resistant depression. So again, the most severe form of depression. And what they did was they used the percent reduction in the MADRAS score, which is a screening scale that's used to kind of assess depressive symptoms, mostly used in research. Now, they did this over a four-week period, and what they ended up finding was that there was a significant reduction in this screening scale score, up to 52.5% of the people in the SAINT protocol had a significant reduction versus 11.1% in the SHAM group. And that's important because the SHAM group ensures that everybody who's in this study or participating in this study is truly like randomized and double blinded. They don't know whether or not they're receiving the treatment, right? Because they're going to put them in the machine. They're going to make everything seemed the same way it would be if you were receiving the actual treatment for TMS, only the sham group did not receive the treatment, of course. But the setup was the same. They had, were hooked up to the machine, same amount of time, same amount of contact with the treatment team, etc. So significant reduction in depressive symptoms, and the remission rates in this study were quite high. They were 79%. So again, I said at the beginning, about 80% is the remission rate. So when we're talking remission, we're talking complete relief of all depressive symptoms. Now, of course, some people in the sham group also had complete remission. That would be 13.3% of those individuals received, felt that they had complete remission. There are, these are significant results, right? So when we're thinking about this, these are, this is the most difficult population to treat. These patients would classically be referred for ECT or ketamine treatment. And it's important to point out that the participants had a few things going for them that might enhance the results here. Number one, they were with the treatment team for 10 hours a day. Like I said, it's 10 sessions, each taking about an, you know, an hour or so to complete the whole process. Not necessarily the time spent in the machine, but about an hour. So 10 hours per day of contact with the treatment team, which is significant. And that can lead to remission of depression, depressive symptoms in and of itself. So this could be what we would consider, again, a confounding factor. The other thing to point out here is that there's only 32 participants, which is a relatively low number for a randomized controlled trial. We usually like to see several hundred participants, and even on bigger scales, thousands of participants if possible, the more the better usually to demonstrate efficacy of a treatment. So these are both confounding factors. However, as I pointed out, it was very important that they did sham treatment to help to control some of that so that you were not getting as much confounding and bias in your result as you otherwise would. The one thing that was more common in the treatment group, which could alert somebody to the fact that they were receiving treatment, is the treatment group experienced more headaches, where the sham group did not. Now, the authors of this study justified the low participant number, or the N of 32, because they say that they achieved a very large effect size and statistical significance without the need for enrolling additional participants. So they justified it by saying essentially we got such a robust response from the small number of people that we don't need to enroll more people to prove that this works. 
What is currently missing from the research here is a large randomized controlled trial that's conducted independently of the research group who designed the same protocol. So we need to look out for that in the future. It's a very important piece to proving that the remission rates here are as high as this treatment group is talking about. So one question you guys may have at this point is how does TMS work and what is the proposed mechanism of action of SYNC? Well, TMS, as I've said before, is a non-invasive neuromodulation technique that works on specific areas of the brain by generating a magnetic field which induces neuronal cell membranes to depolarize in the brain under the location of the coil. So this is kind of complicated stuff, but it explains how you activate certain neurons in a certain location, specifically the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And that's essentially how it works. Now, placing the coil in the correct location is critical. And like I said before, there's a 30% chance of missing that location when MRI is not used to map the exact location. So SAINT specifically, this protocol, is thought to alter brain connectivity and increase neuroplasticity in ways that traditional forms of TMS do not do. Now, the preliminary evidence suggests that this connectivity and neuroplasticity is located between the amygdala, the insula cortex, and the medial frontal gyrus, and this is altered in meaningful ways, resulting in improvement in depressive symptoms. Now, studies are underway to assess this mechanism of action further, and we would like to see those studies before concluding exactly how this works, but that's a general idea of how TMS does what it does and also what separates it from what separates SAINT from other traditional forms of TMS. Okay guys, so now the part that you've been waiting for and that is how does SAINT differ from other forms of TMS and what makes it unique or special? So first it differs in the time frame. As I said earlier in this video, it takes place over the course of five days and that person is having 10 sessions per day for five days. Now TMS normally takes a full six weeks to complete and the treatments during those five days are not as intense. Like I said here in Saint, five days with 10 sessions per day, where standard TMS usually only occurs once per day. Now the time frame also differs. So the time for each treatment in the same protocol is much shorter, lasting approximately 10 minutes compared to the 20 to 45 minutes usually required for TMS. So these are short duration sessions, 10 of them in total over the course of five days. There are actually three established forms of TMS and they all differ not so much in the way that they do what they do, the mechanism of action, they differ in the time required to complete the treatment. So the first TMS machines used what was called a figure eight coil and this took 45 minutes to complete each session. So you'd have to do 45 minutes per day over the course of six weeks to complete your TMS treatment. And then the H coils were invented by a company called Brainsways. And these sessions take only 20 minutes to complete. Now the one that we're using here in the same protocol and that's also available, like I said, by other companies is called Theta Burst Stimulation. And Theta Burst Stimulation only takes three minutes and this is the one that we're using here. Now the next question was about where to place the coil and how to place it. So traditionally, I'm gonna take you through the traditional method of doing so at most TMS centers. So many TMS centers, what they do is they move the coil around in the area of the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and they look to see where the person's thumb twitches. So this is the so-called thumb center and if you take a look at a homunculus, which is essentially a graphical or drawing representation of where these structures are on the brain, you can see that the thumb center is very large and that's why it is used. Also, this area is traditionally about seven centimeters away from the thumb center. The, so the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is seven centimeters away from this thumb center. So we look for the location where the thumb twitches. Once we find that, we move the coil seven centimeters away from that location. And then that will get us into the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex theoretically. So you can see that this is not a very precise method. So what they did with the same protocol and other, and even other forms of TMS actually for that matter, this is not the only company that uses MRI guided placement of the coil. 
But again, there's MRI guided placement of the coil so that you can ensure that it's in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex like it's supposed to be. Now, so the other thing that's unique about the SAINT protocol is that they claim to have a special algorithm for locating the prefrontal cortex, and this is unique to their machine only. This still needs to be tested, and we'll, and we'll see as these machines come into clinical practice and more investigations are conducted. All right, guys, so let's wrap the video up and let's get my take on it. So I've had a chance to review the literature and read these articles and take a look at the publications that they have made so far. And I got to say, I'm excited. I'm always glad when there's innovation in any area of psychiatry, specifically here we're talking about TMS. And the results so far, honestly, have been quite impressive. Now, we have to keep in mind, though, that these machines are being marketed by a startup company that's left the world of academia. It's designed to make a profit, right? So this, this, there is financial interest on the part of the people conducting most of these studies, as well as the people marketing the machine and these unique guidelines. Now, it's unclear if you actually need to purchase their machine to produce similar results. As I said before, Theta Burst TMS already exists, MRI guided placement of the coil already exists, and the company claims that they developed this algorithm for placing the coil that is unique, and this claim, like I said, needs to be investigated further to ensure that that is true. Another concern that I have is that most of the research that's been published on the same protocol has been published by the same research group, that original group out of Stanford that is now working as a private startup to market their idea. So we lack a true reproduced large randomized control trial that's independent of this study group. So that's something to look out for and something that I think will be important in determining whether or not this truly is as successful as they have been promoting it to be. My final concern is actually regarding the application of this treatment for the average depressed patient. So it requires a full five days and 10 hours a day of treatment. So that's a lot for anybody to invest, to be in a location for a full five days, um, away from work, away from family, and to be doing such intense treatment 10 hours per day can be difficult. So I think that's one of the barriers to using this. Now this may or may not be feasible, we'll find out as more as it's used more readily in clinical practice. And we haven't even talked about not only the intensity of the treatment, but the cost and will insurers pay for it. These are other potential barriers. So what will it cost to do this treatment and will your insurance company cover it? I would also like to see eventually, on top of a large randomized controlled trial independently published of the group that designed the protocol, I would also like to see a head-to-head -head study where they compare the same protocol to ketamine and ECT. So I think that's also something that we absolutely need in the literature to make the definitive argument that this is better than ECT or better than ketamine treatment that's available already for treatment-resistant depression. So I'm going to hold it there, guys. If you like the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me to know that you guys are getting value from this. And if you want to see more neuromodulation videos, let me know in the comments section below. I'll be looking forward to those shortly.